Uh, well, I stumbled around from thing to thing. I had a very unsettled early life. Uh, I'm a dropout from two PhD programs, one in economics and the other in music theory. I got a lot further in music theory, but um, I studied a number of other topics as well. And due to what I would call a conversion experience in my mid-30s, I became deeply interested in theology and philosophy. So uh, although I never studied that formally, uh, I worked with a number of uh, well-regarded uh, Jewish theologians uh, and learned from them privately. So uh, I'd say I'm not particularly good at anything, so I had to keep jumping around. One of the doctorates was in uh, economics, and I became a financial journalist. And um, I stumbled into the company of the supply side movement back in the 1980s. If you remember, Reaganomics was supply side economics, tax cutting and free markets, and say currencies and so forth. Um, so, Forrest Gump like, uh, I ended up uh, knowing the key people uh, involved in that, like Art Laffer of the Laffer Curve, Robert Mundell, the Nobel Prize winner whose work was the theoretical basis for supply side economics. Uh, and eventually, I joined a supply side consulting firm called Polyconomics. My partner was Jude Wineski, the original supply sider. I also worked at times with Art Laffer's consulting firm. And from there, uh, I was uh, headhunted into a couple of Wall Street firms. I started at Bear Stearns, and I eventually became the head of fixed income research at uh, Bank of America. Well, I started out um, in the 60s as a left winger. Uh, Ronald Reagan convinced me of the error of my ways, and the Reagan Revolution opened my eyes to what a great country the United States is and what it takes uh, to keep it great. Uh, and that capacity, I did some consulting work for the first Reagan administration. Uh, and from there, I went on to uh, Republican friendships and uh, working with the supply siders. Um, I'm good at math, so I picked up a lot of bond math and ended up doing reasonably well uh, in, uh, in research in Wall Street. I think the industry was thoroughly corrupt, and I left it because I was asked to do things which I considered to be uh, illegal and even felonious, uh, uh, as opposed to simply immoral. Um, Wall Street, for 20 years, made most of its money getting overpaid to supply people with extreme amounts of leverage that they shouldn't have been using by getting around regulations. And the Federal Reserve rubber stamped it, and the bank examiners and the Treasury rubber stamped it, and that got us into the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, a lot of that was, I think everyone on Wall Street knew they were doing something wrong. They knew it would come to a horrible end, but they hoped that they would get their bonuses out and cash in their restricted stock before uh, the end came. Madoff was a complete criminal scam. He was simply stealing money. Um, what the banks did was do irresponsible and reckless things with depositors' money, take risks they absolutely shouldn't have in order to artificially inflate their earnings and pay themselves big bonuses. But they did that legally because the Federal Reserve and the Treasury turned a blind eye to it and gave them all kinds of loopholes through which to do it, through which to put on massive amounts of leverage. Um, as I said, uh, I objected to it. Uh, I left Bank of America in 2005, I guess, um, in a dispute with management over issues uh, related to that. So yes, Wall Street uh, certainly contributed to the crash in a huge way. And I think it's scandalous that the Obama administration failed to prosecute a single banker for what had to be the greatest financial scam in history. The ride of Genghis Khan 
but the law is the law. Mm -hmm. Markets don't exist without law. I mean, markets don't simply form themselves like amoebas and reproduce. There are certain rules, like what does it take to go to enter a market? What does it take to exit? These are legal matters. For example, how do you go bankrupt? In Germany, you don't go bankrupt. You carry your debts around for the rest of your life. Hmm. That's one reason why Germans are less eager to take risks than Americans. If you're an American, you go bankrupt, it's bad, but you can start again. Germany, that's your only chance. You tend to be very cautious. Then there's a the question, what does it take to go into the market? Suppose I say, I'm a bank. Set up a card table outside the bookstore here. I'll take your deposits. Hmm. I'll give you 20% interest. Now, of course, the law won't let me do it, and they shouldn't. But there are laws about what it takes to be a bank that accepts deposits from customers. So laws are required. There are a set of rules. The idea of a pure free market is the abstract illusion of certain you know, theorists who you know, we can talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I believe in enforcing, as a conservative, I believe in following and enforcing the laws. I got interested in the intersection of theology and politics. Now, that's not really a controversial statement because if you have uh, religious wars being fought on a large scale, certainly theology and politics may have a great to do with each other. If you're in politics, you may not be interested in theology, but theology is interested in you. Mm -hmm. So the question that uh, fascinated me is why do you see persistent self-destructive behavior on the part of very large groups of people in entire you know, countries, political movements, religious movements, and so forth. And what was the meaning of 9-11? Uh, what did it mean to have very large numbers of people who were willing to commit suicide in order to inflict damage on the civilians of other countries. To my knowledge, this has never happened before in all of history. It really is a new and terrible thing. So what kind of despair, what kind of perverse mental process goes into a decision to sacrifice so many lives to hurt civilians on the other side? This is a, not simply a clash of civilizations. Mm -hmm. This is a, a civilizational death wish which really requires a different kind of evaluation. So some of the theology I've been studying, particularly that of uh, Franz Rosenstein, great German Jewish theologian of the World War I era, uh, I thought gave me t uh, better tools to try to understand what was happening in these new religious wars. Uh, I began writing about it just to get some ideas off my chest with no anticipation that anybody would be interested in such abstruse material. To my complete shock and dismay, the columns became very popular. So I was asked to keep writing them, uh, and I did. And For who I am. Oh, uh, Asia Times. Okay. Asia Times had been a print newspaper during the 1990s in Asia. In the Asian financial crisis of 1997, the print edition failed. It survived as a website. Uh, it was a scruffy, sort of an expat bar of a website. Uh, but my columns uh, made it quite popular for a while. So they ended up getting uh, circulated in places I never would have guessed. For example, they were read very, very closely in the Pentagon. And I ended up becoming a consultant uh, for the Pentagon afterwards by people who had been reading my columns for years. I, I did a couple of other things in the financial industry. Uh, then after the great crash, uh, there was really no Wall Street to go back to. Um, I had been working for a startup hedge fund. It was very difficult to start up hedge funds after the great crash. So I thought, forget about it. And in the meantime, uh, a close friend, Joseph Bottom, became editor of First Things. First Things had actually asked me to write under the byline Spengler about these issues. So I had written a couple of pieces for first things. I was asked to join the masthead. 
and I thought it was a fabulous opportunity to contribute and also to learn. And for me, it was most of all a learning experience. Mm -hmm. To be an editor is to be a pupil. And I had the great uh, 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 privilege of editing the work of some very important religious writers from whom I was able to learn a great deal. Mm -hmm. That actually led to me becoming Orthodox Jewish. I had been attending a sort of more liberal Jewish uh, synagogue mm -hmm. before, but that experience convinced me to um, accept the, uh, uh, the full responsibility of uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish obligations. There is a Vatican Islamologist, I believe he's still alive, but he was an advisor to Benedict XVI. His name is uh, 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 Khalid Samir, who's an Arab Christian, who wrote a couple of very good books about Islam. And his explanation, I think, is as good as any I've read, which is that Islam, since it has no magisteria, it has no masora or traditional body, uh, is really whatever Muslims wish it to be. So you can have peaceful Muslims, you can have warlike Muslims, and they're all legitimate interpretations of Islam because there is no authoritative interpretation of Islam. Um, I think it's really up for Muslims to decide whether theirs is a religion of peace or a religion of jihad, whether they're tolerant or intolerant. Um, but I think that said, one shouldn't prejudge. But if you have a religion that's held by 1.4 billion people, whatever the number is, even if 1% of those people are committed to terrorism, you're talking about a very, very large number of prospective terrorists. And then according to every survey, uh, one sees, the, uh, although it's a minority of Muslims who say they support suicide bombing, jihad, and so forth, they're still extremely large numbers. So the problem is whether the moderate Muslims are willing to crack down on violent Muslims or whether they consider that a legitimate expression of Islam which they might not personally share but have a certain sympathy for. For example, um, one doesn't see uh, Muslims leading demonstrations in Europe to denounce Islamist attacks. Uh, the moderate community, which is really quietist, doesn't want to be involved in politics, tends to stay away because, in my view, they're afraid of the jihadists. Jihadists exercise as much terror against Muslims, and probably more, than against anyone else. Historically, there are many more Muslim victims of suicide bombings and terrorism than there are non-Muslim victims. Even if the vast majority of Muslims are not in favor of terror and are basically quietists, uh, the jihadists are able to influence the overall Muslim world by intimidation. So it's a very complex question. And there's yet another problem, which is the problem of traditional society. Traditional society gets vaporized by globalization. If you look at, for example, the Western European countries, which were most traditional, like the Southern Europeans, until a couple of generations ago, they were very Catholic at very high rates of mass attendance, very high rates of fertility, very large families. At a certain point, in a very short period of time, everyone from Spain, Italy, to lesser extent Ireland, Portugal, and so forth, went from being very religious to very secular. Same thing happened in Quebec. The same phenomenon has happened in every Muslim country where you have mass adult literacy. The moment they get to the modern world and literacy appears to be the decisive parameter, uh, their fertility collapses. So Iran, although it's ruled by a really foul theocracy, is probably one of the most secular countries in the world. It also has one of the lowest birth rates outside the industrial world and is facing a major demographic crisis. So there are yeah, numerous dimensions to this. And uh, I, I really think we do ourselves a disservice by saying 
as a Muslim plot to impose Sharia law in the United States and every Muslim is part of it and so forth. But we do have a certain kind of problem with the entire Muslim world as long as the jihadists can intimidate people who themselves are not jihadists and set the tone. So it's subtle, it's difficult, uh, but it is a serious problem. Americans have to learn not to underestimate China and the Chinese. Uh, this is a country of enormously talented people with a system so radically different from ours that it's uh, often hard to fathom. Um, China is, has accomplished in the last 30 years uh, an economic transformation which is completely unique in history. For example, 600 million people have moved from the countryside to the city. They've gone from very unproductive, traditional, hand labor kind of agriculture work to modern industrial jobs in the city. 600 million people is the population of all of Europe, from the Ural Mountains to the Irish Sea. That's, they built the equivalent of a new Rome, Paris, Glasgow, Milan, Edinburgh, Copenhagen, in order to accommodate these people. Uh, personal income in the last 25 years has increased 16 or 17 times. So people who grew up having a dirt floor, an outhouse, and if they were lucky, a bicycle, now have central heating, indoor plumbing, and a car. It's an incredible transformation. Now, we tend to have the image of the Chinese as uh, you know, a beehive of mindless uh, drones who live off stolen Western technology. Now, it's certainly true when you're coming from nowhere and trying to get to somewhere, it's a lot more efficient to imitate than to reinvent the wheel for yourself. So the Chinese did nothing but copy the West for a long time, but about five, six years ago, that changed radically. And uh, there are now, there's one Chinese company, it's a telecommunications equipment company, top of the world, called Huawei, mm -hmm. which owns more patents than any other company in the world. And their share of top line that goes to R&D is bigger than Microsoft's, bigger than Cisco's. Uh, they employ many thousands of European engineers. They bankrupted their competition in Europe and hired all their engineers. So some of their biggest research centers are Western. We face a formidable challenge from China. And it's not simply that they stole our automobile jobs or steel jobs. We're talking about new technologies which will define the economy going forward. That's what really worries me, that the technological gap between us and China is closing. And that's something we should be really concerned about. Uh, and as I've said, most Americans tend to underestimate what the Chinese have done. They tend to deprecate Chinese accomplishments. Uh, I think there are many terrible things about Chinese society. I'm not an admirer of Chinese civilization. Uh, I believe in freedom. It's a coercive culture. Uh, but I respect it for its accomplishments and what it still may accomplish. Well, I think the most important thing for us to understand as Americans is that we've come through a period of between 1945, say, and 2005, period of uh, 60 years, where the United States simply called the shots. We were the victor of World War II. We dictated terms to Europe and Asia. Uh, the Soviet Union challenged us. It was a serious challenge. But ultimately, we crushed them in the Cold War. And when communism fell in 1989, the communist system was humiliated and in ruins. So for most of the experience, of our parents and grandparents for most of their lifespan, the United States was what it was. We are not alone anymore. We share this world. We still should be 
the number one power in the world. But it's not going to be as easy as it was in the past. I think we're going to have to reach deep into the roots of uh, American innovation and ingenuity and optimism and invention and understand what made us great in the first place in order to continue to be great. Mm -hmm. And Hillsdale is a great place to do this because that has a great tradition as uh, a college that represents the best of what America always was and tries to teach it. So you're probably better off here than any other spot in the United States to, uh, to appreciate this. I think it's a great college and you're lucky to be here. So take advantage of it.